When we were stuck inside, we wondered, would we face the plague of gun violence again? Will we fear gathering in our schools and our churches again? Will we be shot for the color of our skin again? But a fight for justice forced us out to fill the empty streets. Black Americans are still being killed for being black in America. The pandemic hitting black, indigenous, and people of color disproportionately has only worsened the epidemic of gun violence in those same communities. Because it's clear the fight for racial justice is still on and we won't live without it. In Colorado, he stood against hatred, but in Wisconsin, he carried a Confederate flag. In Arizona, she stood for her patience, but in Michigan, she carried a swastika. They bought guns in record numbers, but we took it to the streets. So when we leave our homes this time, will the people carrying weapons of war and banners of hatred decide our future again? Or will we stand up and demonstrate our power? Our power means we demand all gun sales will be licensed. Our power means we demand weapons of war be banned for good. Our power means lawmakers must listen. Our power means we refuse to watch black people be murdered in the streets. Our power means we refuse to fear for our lives. We refuse to live without justice. It's our power and we will use it. Good morning. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jackie Alamany, author of Power Up, the Washington Post early morning newsletter. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm thrilled to introduce our guests. We've got David Hogg, a survivor of the 2018 shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and co-founder of March for Our Lives. Joining David is Alexis Confer. She's the executive director of March for Our Lives. Thank you to both of you for joining us, especially during this really crazy time with just under 90 days until the election. I don't wanna waste any time here, so let's talk about this really powerful ad that we just saw. It marks March for Our Lives' first foray into presidential politics. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What states it's running in? Uh, Jackie, thank you for having us. Excited to be here with my colleague David as well. Um, this is our first ad and we know that we really need to make it very clear for especially first time voters who are heavily Generation Z, uh, what is at stake. They know what's at stake far too well um, and are making real choices based on issues and policies, not candidates. And so our goal with this ad is going to be running in nine states, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, Arizona, Michigan, Colorado and Wisconsin. Uh, we know that we need to connect to the intersectional issues that young people care about from uh, racial inequities to gun violence to climate change. We have tons of young voters out there who are fired up on so many issues and they want to hold their elected officials accountable. So making that connection between issues and voting and protests is more important than ever with Generation Z. Yeah, and I do, I do have to know, I have reported last week that the ad played on Fox and Friends on Thursday morning. Was that sending any specific message to someone in particular? I think people need to recognize that if you're voted into power, you work for the people. Um, and so every elected official is there at the will of the people. That's why we live and work in a democracy. And so I hope that there was some self-reflection that happened for people in DC. And I also want to know, there is no clear call to action in the ad. What exactly are you asking young voters to do, David? I think the main thing that we're asking young voters to do is realize that there are many uh, tools in our, I guess you could say, our kind of toolbox for creating uh, change. Um, protesting is one of them. Voting is one of them. Writing, you know, letters or, you know, emailing our congressmen and representatives um, is another. Um, and basically connecting all the, these issues that young people are rallying around right now, be it climate change, racial injustice, or gun violence, and making them realize that gun violence, uh, yes, like there is a, a major part of it that has to do with the need to strengthen uh, the laws in the United States. But we also need to discuss the, the large amount of systemic racism and the historic amount of injustice that is a, uh, of which gun violence is a symptom in our country, and realize that Although even if, if even if we address every way that a person possibly you know gets a gun, we also need to address why they're pulling the trigger in the first place, and that means addressing things like militarism, racism, and poverty as well. Um, and I, 
I think that's part of what it, it, it uh, the point of it is, is to make us realize those connections and realize that, you know, um, there's no mistake that even, even with the more recent passing of, you know, Congressman John Lewis, um, and the work that he did even, you know, at the March for Our Lives in Atlanta, uh, he, you know, he talked about how he's always worked, he's worked against the NRA, um, and on top of that, how the I think we see now the communities that he fought for and the communities that are also most impacted by uh, gun violence are also the ones that are most impacted by COVID. And it's because of the ones that face the most obstacles as a whole um, that have been built against them as marginalized communities in this country. And this isn't just a conversation around laws, it's a conversation around uh, the injustice that drives gun violence as well. And, and on the topic of you know, Congressman John Lewis, who obviously fought his entire life for the right to vote for the Voting Rights Act. I think some might say that you might have missed out on an opportunity by not explicitly calling for young voters to vote. Why didn't you? This is going to be an entire way of bringing young people to the fold. We want to make sure they're met where they need to be met. Um, and we've heard repeatedly from young voters that they want to hear their issues voiced in a very clear way and not downplay the power of First Amendment and protest and direct actions and making your voices heard publicly. Uh, to David's point, we are going to be pivoting to the voting message uh, and reminding people that you can choose for people who are ideally just into positions of power that you can hold accountable. We are not looking for someone who's going to save us all. We're looking for a public servant who can actually uh, work with communities and be held accountable by the voters that put them into office. So we are going to be pivoting to a voting message. This is just the beginning of our strategy going into the fall. Um, but first and foremost, we want to make sure we're very clear on what's at stake because this is a fight for our lives and people are voting for their lives. And I want to pivot to some of our viewer questions. We had a handful of people submit questions. So first, we're going to take a question from Sue Greenhouse from Pennsylvania. And she's asking what the best way to reach young voters to turn out in November is. Is it ads, Facebook, emails, texts? David is the Gen Zer here. What is the best way to reach you guys? Um, I think it, I think more than anything, it's other young people that are already going out to vote, like myself, um, you know, and talking every young person talking to other young people about voting. Um, I think if there's one thing that certainly, in my opinion, doesn't work, it's older people telling younger people that they need to vote. Although, you know, of course, I agree with that. I think it's a lot better if young people talk amongst themselves about it and don't see it as like, oh, this is something that your parent is telling you that you have to do but rather something that is rebellious and almost like, no, like this is a form of like the teen, um, you know, angry young person angst that so many of us feel. And this is a way of like us, one of the many ways that we can work to create change uh, and go out there and vote. I think another thing is, you know, it's not just, um, it's not just like sending a message to them. I think part of it is those young people that are out there marching right now um, and, you know, have been as well. Um, for those that are interested in talking about it and talking about voting, like, um, talk honestly, it's just younger people talking to other younger people about it and realizing that um, it's not just this is a lot more than just a presidential election. This is a, a, an election that more than likely will determine the future of you know the Supreme Court for Gen Z and every gen for many generate you know another generation at least that comes after us too possibly. Um, and on top of that, there's a ton of down ballot races that really matter. So I think it's other young people really talking to each other about it, not as something that we have to do, but as something like that we can do to frankly, you know, make those in power scared of young people as they should be because they're actively destroying our future as they are right now. Right, yeah, and, I, and I'm sure amid this global pandemic, your get out the vote plans have been, you know, have, have taken a bit of a twist. Um, how has this affected your efforts? You know, so many past events around campaigns and getting out the vote have uh, revolved around in-person events, rallies, concerts, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think um, I want Alexis to talk more about this as well, but we have some really big uh, events that are coming up around, um, although we realize they can't be in person, we want to be safe, of course. Um, it hasn't stopped us from doing smaller actions like recently after um, the, after we filed a complaint against the NRA in 2018 and recently an investigation finally came to um, kind of an end with the New York Attorney General uh, file, basically filing to dissolve the National Rifle Association. Um, March for Our Lives in Virginia uh, through an NRA is over party 
in front of the NRA where we went with a bunch of boxes and stuff, socially distanced, of course, and, a, and we brought a U-Haul um, to help them, you know, move out. Uh, we brought boxes with like thoughts and prayers on them and, you know, different things like that. Um, so that's one way that we see kind of, you know, using a smaller amount of people or even art um, to create highly shareable content on social media for young people to see uh, in a safe manner, along with a lot of other things I'm sure Alexis would love to talk about. Yeah. No, I mean, it, we've had to innovate during this time. I think everyone is trying to uh, grapple with the effects that COVID has had on their families. And I think that we are lucky that we are able to have the ability to pivot quickly online. Uh, this whole movement, uh, March for Our Lives, was built off online mobilization. And so, uh, like many, we're innovating with how we reach our chapter networks, which have 300 chapters nationwide, and how we can bring them into trainings online and hub conversations about uh, things that matter to them, or co conversations around art, like our our power up training series remix we have tons of opportunities for young people to come together online to plan and talk about uh, what matters to them during this next phase of america um, we also do have some large scale events that some have kicked off already so we've been doing this event series called into action live which is um, partnered with sankofa and many other uh, incredible organizations to bring together culture and change makers to talk about uh, what's at stake right now in the world and our country and what kind of change we want to see and so actually tomorrow on international youth day we're going to be having uh, several um, conversations that people can tune into uh, and at the end of the month we're kicking off a nine state event series uh, vote for our lives our power in the states and they'll be highlighting um, systemic uh, inequities in nine states and why uh, groups on the ground are doing incredible work um, and how we can actually mobilize young voters around the work that's going on the ground using art as a conversation topic so it'll be um, amazing art installations across these nine states and more to come on that, but it's an opportunity for us to really highlight the local work on the ground, also with some of our national partners like Sunrise Movement and United We Dream and Indigenous Youth Council. Um, there's really a collaborative spirit spirit of bringing youth together across the board in our um, interactions, and we hope that we can continue to build around upon the digital assets while we try to figure out if and when it's safe to go back more um, visibly offline. Yeah, and I, I do hope you guys and your families have remained healthy during this whole ordeal. And I hope everyone watching this live show right now is wearing a mask in public and staying safe. Um, I, David, I do want to get back to the NRA news eventually, but first we need to go back to another viewer question really quickly. Um, this one is from Diane Yamada in New York. And she writes in that her 20 something year old son feels like his vote doesn't count because of the electoral college. How can she persuade him to vote? Um, I think part of it is realizing that, again, um, it's not solely a presidential election uh, that we're having here um, right now. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, local races that matter as well. You know, even even if you feel like your vote doesn't necessarily count that much as much as you would like it to, because currently we have the Electoral College and we don't really have a um, Sorry, I was going to go off on a tangent there, but um, <laughs> either way, you can. I, I think we can work to elect a, a Congress and Senate um, that also hold the next president accountable, even if you're, you know, say on the same side, but you want to be, you want something more progressive or something like that. But um, on top of that, you know, there's actually a lot of work being done on the ground in some states. I think around some of the, some things like the, uh, I think it was called the um, uh, the Electoral College like Compact, which basically would. Um, be a more constitutional way of going about creating a popular vote system. But to do that, we need people to go out there and keep voting um, and know that it's even though like right now the electoral college system may not be the best, there's still a lot of other things on the ballot that matter too. And, you know, voting for presidential elections matters as well. Yeah, and I have to note, there has been this narrative throughout the entire primary that support for Joe Biden among young voters has been pretty milk toast. that most of that support has gone to Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Is, does, does, young Biden, does Joe Biden have young voters or are they a shoe in You know, I can't speak for all young people, um, just as I can, you know, uh, I can't really generalize for my entire generation, but um, I, I guess what you could say is that um, young people want to want to elect someone that uh, isn't, 
you know, we want to have a chance of at least trying to have any semblance of a future on our planet um, and address the major issues like climate change, gun violence, and other things. I think there's a lot of young people that realize that, um, frankly, Donald Trump is not doing that basically at all right now. And the alternative is basically an end to our generation and possibly an end to the human race. Um, because that's, I mean, we're, we're getting to that point with climate change and, you know, all these other major issues that are happening. Um, but I do think that there's still, you know, more work that can be done to um, bring people into the, uh, bring young people specifically into the fold more. Um, but yeah. Well, and I, Alexis, I want to dig a little deeper into that because, you know, you guys obviously have prioritized policy over people and made the choice in that ad as we just saw, to not explicitly endorse any candidates and not endorse Joe Biden over President Trump. But a Harvard poll came out uh, from the Harvard IOP showing that voters aged 18 to 25 are really motivated to oust Trump and that Biden leads among them 51% to 28%. Are you worried that you're missing a really motivating factor and potentially you know, not maximizing your impact? Um, Jack, I'm worried. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you take it. No, I'll, I'll be worried every day until the election. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think that um, for anybody who's worked on a campaign before, you can take nothing for granted. And we know that we need to be inclusive of bringing people into the fold uh, between now and the election on so many issues. And so I think to your question of will young people go out and vote? I think there is a willingness and a hunger to do it. I do think that especially Generation Z, which, who is fueled by activism and reading every single uh, theory out there and taking it to the streets and making their voices heard, unlike any generation I've ever seen personally. Um, these, this is an educated base of people who wanna go out and change their communities and educate in the formal sense, traditional sense, uh, non-traditional sense, you name it, they are making sure that they know everything that's going on in the world around them. And so I think bringing young people to the table in a meaningful way that doesn't feel like a token, that doesn't feel like an afterthought, um, they're not future leaders, they're current leaders. Um, and bringing these current leaders into spaces in a meaningful way in the next uh, less than 90 days is going to be very important. Um, to David's point, people are fearing for their lives. I think that we've seen during COVID that's only exacerbated um, the huge inequities in our country that no one can say just have happened by you know, chance. These are institutionalized inequities that were built to hold down black and brown communities and, and, and make a situation where we have huge gaps in education, huge gaps in the way people can even go to vote. And so I'm, I'm more terrified about complete voter suppression, holding back the young uh, voices come this election um, and actually suppressing their voices through vote by mail or you name it, the things we've seen being levied um, against voters and democracy should be our most basic right uh, voting in democracy. And Alexis, I'm wondering, is that your diplomatic way of saying that you don't think the Biden campaign is doing enough to engage young voters? No, I, we don't endorse in general. Um, and. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, as vice president, went further um, on guns than many elected officials do. We think that the vice president, if he becomes the president, can go even further. Um, I think that we continue to see the Biden campaign listening more and more to youth voices. There's been a lot of uh, calling in young people in recent months, and, I, and we hope to see more of that. Um, so we're optimistic, and I think uh, our coalition with many other organizations across the board who speak directly to young people too, recognize that we're going to have also direct messaging to our bases to say, uh, we have your back, your voice matters, and um, voting for an elected official is important, but there's lots of other work to do as well, in addition to voting. So um, I'm always a diplomat, but I, I think that we have seen some major strides um, in the Biden campaign in recent months. And in the wake of George Floyd's murder at the hands of Minneapolis police officers, we've seen these protests erupt throughout the country with Black Lives Matter being front and center. I'm wondering, David, you know, how you see the intersection of March for Our Lives and BLM? Well, it's actually something, I'm glad that you asked that, because it's something that I think isn't touched on nearly enough, which is the connections between um, racial injustice and gun violence. I think March for Our Lives um, and a lot of the gun violence prevention space as a whole too. But um, I think one of, one of the things that March for Our Lives specifically as a youth focused or like Gen Z uh, focused org um, is, 
is that police violence and specifically police gun violence is also gun violence and it still needs to be addressed in the first place. Um, and uh, on top of that, that, you know, we see ourselves in hopefully as a, a, a supportive role, um, not one where we're, you know, part of what many young people call like the nonprofit industrial complex which is, you know, the system that just reinforces these power structures, but doesn't actually end up changing anything, at least in many young people's opinions. And instead, what I think March for Our Lives tries to do is ask people how we can be supportive of the work that they're doing on the ground around these things and try just simply doing that, whatever it is, you know, even if it's something as simple as like, you know, you need people to help you, you know, get a chair for a, you know, not right now, but like prior to the pandemic, like a town hall or something. Like simply just asking how we can help because obviously, um, you know, March for Our Lives is not a Minneapolis, you know, focused only organization. Same way it's not only a Parkland focused organization, but we need to ask those people that are most affected by these issues how we can help. And I think a big thing around that too has been, you know, talking to other young people that are in BLN, you know, asking them to, uh, if they'd be interested in coming to like March and working with us too and how to, you know, continuously build a better organization. Uh, encounter the narrative that gun violence is, you know, is something that um, only matters when it happens in a community that looks like Parkland, when in reality it matters in any community, no matter what it looks like. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of been the interaction and realizing that, yeah, voting matters, but protesting and making the, the people in power uncomfortable is also a, a really uh, important way and actually essential way, in my opinion, of creating change. Because when politicians are comfortable, they typically don't do anything. And we have another viewer question. I wanna thank all our viewers for the really thoughtful questions that you've provided for us today. We've got Jane Baker from Massachusetts, and she's asking, what do you see as the biggest barrier to translating youth activism into actual votes? Youth turnout has historically been low. Yeah, that's a really great question. Thanks for that, Jane. Um, I would say there's a couple of major obstacles I think one of the first ones is that, um, you know, I, I think we may have even seen this, you know, in the 1960s when there was a record, you know, voter turnout with young people again, where people turned out and kind of eventually, in, in my view, um, although I, I wasn't alive at the time, so I can only speak so much on it, um, they turned out and then the, you know, Watergate happened and a bunch of other stuff happened and uh, they kind of lost faith in the system, you know, understandably, because it's like you turned out once and there isn't that much that changed. So I think uh, a big uh, object for us making change is realizing it's not going to be Joe Biden or any single politician um, that's going to help us address all of these issues. It's going to have to be years of voting consistently and turning out at high levels to make sure that the priority of every policy that the United States government and state and local governments pass is the future of our country and especially the young people that are going to be most affected by those policies. Secondly, I think a major, um, a major obstacle that isn't talked about too is youth voter suppression is a huge problem. Um, even in Florida, and I believe in Parkland in 2018, um, for, I don't know the, I, I think it was about 15% of young people that voted by mail in Parkland had their votes thrown out. And one of those reasons, for example, in Florida is that um, they know that there's a lot of older people that can vote by mail or that vote by mail, for example, that tend to vote a, tend to vote a more certain way, right? So they want to make sure that they're able to continue to vote. So what they, one of the things that I believe that they did was they made this law that says that a fear signature that you registered to vote with. So for example, I first registered to vote in Florida when I was, um, you know, getting my driver's license as part of like a motor voter or, or whatever. And when I signed my signature, I thought I was signing a receipt. And it's a terrible, like basically unlegible signature. But if I, if my signature on my absentee ballot doesn't match that signature that I registered to vote with, that ballot does not get counted and it gets thrown out, right? And they know that that is something that disproportionately affects younger people. At least in my case, we tend to vote, you know, may tend to vote more progressive or vote against people that are in power. Um, and so yeah, we need to talk about youth voter suppression and the barriers that there are already are to young people voting, especially when they live on college campuses or when they have to vote by mail. Yeah, there are so many friction points that I think people don't even think about. So those are a lot of good points, David. Um, I want to get though to the news from last week. 
New York Attorney General Tish James announced that she was suing the NRA, called for its dissolution, and also called for the removal of NRA CEO Wayne LaPierre, saying he's engaged in decades worth of fraudulent activity. I know from my reporting and talking with you guys that there was a lot of behind the scenes work done there in helping bring about this suit potentially. Can you tell us more about that? Um, Alexis, you wanna? I, I want to say I, I want David to talk about uh, the incredible work that they did uh, a year and a half ago before I was even with the organization. But uh, we've known for a long time that the NRA is corrupt. We've known that they don't represent even their membership in a meaningful way. Uh, most NRA members actually believe um, in some sort of responsible uh, gun protocols. Uh, the NRA has lined its pockets for decades and decades and decades. And I'm incredibly proud as a New Yorker to see an elected official uh, stand up to them in a meaningful way. Um, I'm sure that uh, AG Tish James will be hit with met much backlash from the NRA as we've all seen working on gun violence prevention, but this is just the beginning of tackling the gun lobby um, and many organizations, you know, March for Lives with many other organizations, organizations on the ground for years have been trying to call uh, this nonprofit to task because there are certain uh, inherent things that nonprofits must adhere to and this complete gross abuse of power from private jets to private vacations to lining your pockets with your um, dues paying members money um, is completely inappropriate and it is a, and it is appropriate that uh, legal action is being called into place. So we see it as a step of many. Uh, we have Attorney General, General Tish James is back on this. Um, it should be noted that she's uh, the first female first of uh, AG of color in New York State. Um, and so huge win overall, amazing, amazing kudos to the AG um, and we have her back, but this is just the beginning of what will potentially be a long battle with the NRA. Yeah, and yeah, I, 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 guys, oh, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, yeah, uh, we especially, you know, want to, it's not like we, uh, I'm, I'm never the biggest fan of a lot of elected officials, but it does make me happy and give me more faith in the system when I see someone like, you know, Attorney General Tish James um, take such a lead on that and take courage to stand up to an organization that does not believe, uh, that believes it's above the law. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I'm also, um, I think it's just really funny because if you read through like kind of the, uh, I guess you could say like the proceedings from the case and um, different things that the attorney general talked about. One thing that we found out, for example, was that when Dana Loesch, um, their spokesperson, came down to Florida um, to debate the children that had just survived the school shooting about why an AR-15 uh, needs more protection than the lives of our children, um, which he ultimately completely failed to do and got I would say, in my opinion, obliterated on the debate stage by a bunch of teens. Um, they actually paid over $100,000 to fly her and like two other people on a private jet to go to that town hall. Um, and that's just one example of their mass corruption. On top of that, like after the march, uh, we also found out that one of their main lobbyists in Florida got a massive pay increase um, because they realized that we were here to stay. And even when we were in front of the NRA the other day, they parked a car in front of their sign because they, they were so afraid of us. They even, you know, like they, they know that we are here and we're going to stay. And frankly, we're March for Our Lives and young people especially are going to outlive the NRA. And well, guys, I think there's too much time yeah, left, sorry. but I want to get to this important question really quickly and maybe leave things on a little bit more of a, a hopeful note. But for young people who are stuck at home inside the pandemic, all of their fall plans canceled, who might not be enthused by any of the candidates that they're seeing right now, you know, what do you recommend to them to get involved and to stay hopeful going into November? Um, honestly, I don't think, I, although I'm, a, I'm always gonna be, a, I, I'm always a fan of hope, I, will, I would be lying if I said I was always hopeful. I think it's just finding whatever your but your best motivation is, even if it's anger at the people in power, you know, righteous anger at the people in power for not protecting our generation. Um, and, you know, just doing so many, so many things that are in the, are, are in, are in the self-interest of the people that are in power rather than in the actual interest of the, the people that they should be protecting first and foremost, which is the future of our country, young people. Um, whatever that motivation is, you should go out and use it, you know, to vote and um, know that it's not, if you think this election isn't going to fix everything, you're right. You're 100% right. 
but it's it's definitely a good way to make a step towards making things a hell of a lot better than they are right now. Um, and it's not going to be just this this uh, election or the next one. It's going to be making consistently voting year after year after year for morally not for Democrats or Republicans, but for morally just leaders that actually care about the future of our country and care about you know my classmates that were killed at my high school. And don't just say they're going to do something like you know President Trump said he was going to do, and then do absolutely nothing when they get a call from an organization like the NRA that gave him $30 million to buy his silence and inaction as hundreds of thousands of Americans have died over his term, but actually take the action and have the courage to do something to stand up to gun violence and protect our generation. But we have to not only go out and protest, but we have to vote those people into power. And eventually our generation, if we don't learn from the mistakes that, are, that we're currently seeing from the quote unquote leaders that I wouldn't even consider leaders that are in power right now, we're destined to repeat them, but we've got to start rebuilding uh, and build back better this country um, now, or else it might be too late for the next generation. And if we don't go out and vote, uh, Gen Z could end up being the last generation. Do you plan on voting, uh, running for office, yes. David? Um, big... I mean, honestly, I don't know. I, I, it, it's something that I'm always conflicted about because I think about you know pushing the system from the outside and making people uncomfortable. Um, and, but then I look at someone like John Lewis, who was, you know, so amazing. Like he, he talked to us in the, in the, in the weeks after the shooting and helped offer us advice. And I think it's important to have the right people on the outside and the inside, but also, I mean, frankly, I think we got enough, uh, cisgendered great white men in office right now, and it might be time for a little more diversity. So I don't know. Well, guys, I, unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you for such a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Alexis Comfer, David Hogg, thanks again for joining. We also have some fantastic programming coming up with the post live events this week. We've got 23andMe CEO Ann Wojcicki joining us, former CDC director Tom Frieden, and Spelman College President Mary Schmidt Campbell. You can get more information on those events at WashingtonPostLive.com. Thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll see you guys again. I'm Jackie Alamani.